with the hammer and you nearly died. Yes, but... When, when you think about all those poor women that were murdered. Uh, so, you know, I, I think about, I used to think about when they were kids, you know, losing the mothers, but now they'll all be grown up. So, so are they wanting to bring it all up and that, that, that I don't imagine they'd want to know? You see, it's strange, isn't it? Because we go to the cinema and we look at these films yeah. and we think it's got nothing to do. But for you, it was, it was real life. Yes. It happened. Is there ever a day goes by without you thinking, you know, I was attacked by Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper? Well, I don't think about it all the time, but sometimes when things are brought up, programmes are brought up about him. Or films. Yeah, or films. I do then, you know. Uh, I, I just think, oh, how did I get through it all? But I did, see. You so. were the woman who told the police that this was the man who did not have a Geordie accent. Yes, I was. You went through hell. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose many of us would say, well done for rebuilding your life, but it must have been hard. Mm. Oh, yes, it was. But I had a family, you see, and uh, my husband to help me through, so that helped quite a lot. Some of them were on their own, you see or attacked, um, it, it would be very hard for them, I would think. They helped me a lot, you see, did my family, you know, mm. to get over it. Olive, thank you very much. Um, you know, we hate to bring it up again, but you are, you know, a very well-known lady in these parts <laughs> and admire for your bravery, yes. so thank you very much yes. for talking to me again. But what do you think? Is it a tasteless commercialism or is it time to move on and accept that the Yorkshire Ripper murders were a very long time ago? Well, you've heard Olive's views. You can email us at, at bbc.co.uk and we'll try and read some of your comments out before the end of the programme. Harry. The funeral has taken place of Joanne Catley and her two daughters, Phoebe and Emma. They were found stabbed to death at their home near Grimsby. It's believed they were killed by the girl's father, Richard Hicks, whose body was later found beneath the Humber Bridge. Today, hundreds of mourners attended the service at Grimsby Crematorium. Paul Murphy reports. Two small white coffins led the funeral cortege. Phoebe was four years old, Emma was just two. The body of their mother, Joanne, followed close behind, as did hundreds of mourners drawn from across the local community. They died two weeks ago, a frenzied attack at their home in Station Road in Healing, carried out by Richard Hicks, Joanne Catley's former partner, the father of Phoebe and Emma. His body was found beneath the Humber Bridge. He'd abandoned their third daughter, Lily, in the back of his car, though she was unharmed. Today's ceremony attempted to focus on the brief but bright lives of two little girls and a mum who was devoted to them. There were songs chosen by their grandparents. I know it's very difficult to sing when people are grieving, but I also knew that um, I wanted uh, the family, when they walked down the, uh, the aisle in, in the crematorium, I wanted them to feel the support of the, all the people who were there. Among the flowers, many tributes, small expressions of grief and of disbelief from a community still raw from the terrible events of two weeks ago. Paul Murphy, BBC Look North, Grimsby. And the funeral has taken place today of a 13-year-old boy killed at a motocross centre in Sheffield. Almost 200 mourners filled the parish church at Goldthorpe in the Durham Valley to pay their last respects to Scott Conway. A floral tribute in the shape of a motorbike was carried in the hearse next to the coffin. Many of the mourners were young children. Well, coming up later on Thursday's Look North... The little farmhouse on the prairie. Yes, find out why Yorkshire's struggling farmers are being urged to trade the Dales for Dakota. First more of today's news. Both sides of a family are uniting to discover what's happened to the missing Yorkshire woman Sybil Applequist, who's now been missing for two years. On Tuesday, her husband John from Scarborough was cleared of her murder. Now both Mrs Applequist's brother and the sister of the man acquitted have said the truth must be discovered. They've been speaking today to our correspondent, John Cundy. Though her brother was accused then cleared of murder, Pamela Applequist has had no hesitation 
in uniting with the brother of missing Sybil Applequist. Both want to know the truth after two troubled years. It shouldn't happen to anybody, wherever she is laid. It isn't right. It's not fair that Tony doesn't have closure. I believe it's impossible for, for my sister to have just disappeared as she has. After a failed suicide attempt 15 months ago, John Applequist told police his wife Sybil had left their home and vanished after a row. He was charged with Sybil's murder, but was cleared this week when a judge ruled the evidence didn't stand up. John and Sybil were portrayed in court as a happy couple, but it may not have been so. But when you know two people so well, you know when it's real and when it's just put on for the benefit of other people, and that's what they did, and they did it very well because not a lot of people knew what was going on. Basically, I think they were both very unhappy and they didn't want anybody to know. I don't believe that she's safe. I haven't believed from day one that she's safe, knowing, knowing my sister as, as I do. Um, and, it, yeah, it's absolutely imperative that the police continue in their investigations. Having combed the Bridlington area exhaustively in the past 15 months, police have promised the search for Sybil will continue. You know, it'd be terrible if we find a body, but at least it's the end. We can put it to rest. We had 15 months of, of sheer hell. Um, myself, family, friends, neighbours, we all want to know basically what's happened to Sybil. For me, there's no closure until we actually find her. Like the police, Tony Hornby and Pamela Applequist both believe Sybil is dead, but there can be no peace in their lives till they know for certain. John Cundy. BBC Look North, Bridlington. The investigation into the death of a wealthy Leeds businessman following a raid at his home has taken a bizarre twist. 57-year-old John Looper died on Monday night at his luxury home in Old Woodley. West Yorkshire Police confirmed attempts were made to feed Mr Looper marmalade but declined to comment on reports he was a diabetic and the intruders gave it him as he lapsed into a coma. A post-mortem examination has failed to show a clear cause of death but detectives said they were treating the death as suspicious. Police in Pontefract say they're worried about a teenager who disappeared 11 year, days ago. 19-year-old Julie Curran was last seen by her sister in Hemsworth almost two weeks ago now. She's never gone missing before, and police want to hear from anyone who could know where she is. Now, farmers have for many years claimed they're struggling in this country, but now they're to be offered an alternative. Head for the American Midwest. Business leaders from South Dakota are in Yorkshire to try and tempt our farmers to blaze a transatlantic trail. Kirsty Mitchell has this. It doesn't come much more idyllic than this, but at the tender age of 25, organic dairy farmer Tom Rawson is ready to quit the struggling family business in Dewsbury and head west to the wide open spaces of South Dakota, where the taxes are lower and the profits higher. The UK dairy industry has just gone into meltdown really and the, the price that we get for our product just decreasing all the time. So people from South Dakota are saying they're promising to give us a higher milk price if we go and set up business over there. Scores of Yorkshire farmers are now contemplating the 4,000 mile journey to the Mount Rushmore state. South Dakota is five times the size of Wales, with a population of less than a million. At the moment, though, there simply aren't enough cows to support its expanding dairy industry. It needs an extra 65,000 of them to be precise. And today, cheesemaking magnate Mitch Davis flew into Leeds to persuade Yorkshire farmers to supply them. You won't have the regulatory issues that you have here, the urbanization, the public pressure on farming. You won't have the supply management, so you don't tie up capital in your quota. You can tie it up in your cows. You don't have to farm for all your feed. You can buy your feed from your neighbors and focus on your cows, and it'll allow you to grow your business to a size that'll support the next generation. It's a tempting proposition, and many have already been to South Dakota on fact-finding tours. But the little house on the prairie lifestyle isn't without problems, and many of the state's own farmers have gone out of business. If they're going over to South Dakota, they've got the possibility of um, di producing to different production methods and different systems to get used to, and we don't know the long-term sustainable um, market for, the, for their products over there. This evening, Tom Rawson and a dozen other farmers are meeting in Wakefield to discuss the venture. If they like what they hear, they could soon be on their way to the big country. Kirsty Mitchell, BBC Look North.
cue the cowboy music then. <laughs> Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you've ever tried to get hold of a plumber, well, you'll know it's pretty difficult. Even then, it might be a week <laughs> next Thursday, and that's if you're lucky. <laughs> well, it's a problem that's going to get worse. While plenty of people are coming forward to become skilled tradesmen, it's reckoned about £75 million is needed to train them in Yorkshire alone. Anna Crossley can explain. It's 8 o'clock in the morning and gas engineer Kevin Walton has another busy day ahead of him. He works for Rotherham-based firm GMT, but learned his trade as an apprentice with Sheffield City Council 13 years ago. Most comments you get from people in houses are, uh, it's took me ages to get a hold of a plumber, I can't get hold of a gas fitter. Once you get a builder, you've got to keep him because there ain't enough people out there doing it. Certainly the shortage of skilled people is now so great that getting hold of a plumber and an electrician has never been more difficult. We were looking at bathroom companies. We agreed on one uh, in March and agreed a start date of August the 11th. Um, we had a number of false promises in terms of completion. They said it would take six weeks. And as you can see, in, in February, we still, um, still haven't completed. Luckily, there's a new wave of young people who now want to learn a trade, many spurred on by stories that they can name their price. But ironically, the worry now is that the infrastructure isn't in place to actually train them. We've seen an increase in a dramatic increase in demand in, in all areas, of, of the, particularly the craft training. Oh, the college has grown by 50% in the last four years. Um, and uh, we took on another building uh, last year to try and meet the demand. The Learning and Skills Council, a government body set up to fund further education and training, says employers need to play their part too. Our great concern is that there isn't the interest from employers out there to match what further education colleges can offer them. So perhaps the best advice is, if you know a decent plumber, keep hold of them, and if you don't, get looking. Anna Crossley, BBC Look North. And more of that on The Politics Show on BBC One on Sunday at 12 noon. Thank you very much for joining us for Look North this Thursday. Yes, stay with us because uh, there's a sense of relief. We're meeting the man whose 50-day toilet seat sit-in for better hospice funding has finally come to an end. For the best part of a thousand years, no, I haven't been around all that time, the major oak has been a familiar sight in Sherwood Forest and a part of Robin Hood folklore. We're not going to have that argument again about <laughs> where he was born, are we? Well, actually... Wakefield. Wakefield. <laughs> Nottingham, say how Nottingham views. But uh, scientists have just seen a whole new side of it. They've actually seen the inside of the ancient tree. Now, this tree, where legend has it that the outlaw and his merry men in tights hid from the sheriff, has been given a high-tech medical checkup using the latest in computer-operated sonic equipment. Rob Glass went to sonic. look. Sonic. <laughs> sonic. I thought, yeah, I hoped you wouldn't notice. <laughs> These supporting posts are signs that the major oak really is starting to show her age. Mind you, she has been standing proudly here in Sherwood Forest for over 800 years, but today she's having a medical. In this unique checkup, 24 sensors are attached to the trunk at regular intervals and then allowed to send sound signals to each other. This is by far the biggest tree we've done and probably the most important tree we've done. I think it's the biggest tree that's ever been tried anywhere in the world as far as I know. Uh, up until now, we've used uh, 22 sensors in a tree in Germany, but this is the furthest we've gone so far. A computer analyses the results of this process and produces a colourful cross-section of the major oak, rotten wood, cavities and all. We've got the blue, we've got the pink and we've got the green. Now, these are indicating uh, a cavity in the middle of the tree and uh, to some extent some sort of decay but around the outside you can see the light brown and the dark brown this is indicating the good healthy strong wood which has maintained the tree and there's a good percentage of that so uh, it's very good well i was just telling my grandchildren that we came i came to see it when i was about their age the first time and there was nothing here we just walked straight up and i went inside and stood inside it and it, you know, it would be a shame to lose it. I'm very pleased that it's still living. It, it is a sort of Nottinghamshire landmark, so it's important that it's sort of well looked after. It doesn't really make matter to me that much, so... But it's nice to see it, anyway. We knew that the major oak was um, very vigorous and remarkably healthy for its age, but to have it confirmed like this, yeah, it's quite rewarding, really, to, to know that the tree is in good health and we looking after it well. While it's unlikely that the Major Oak will still be here in 800 years, it's good to know that for the time being at least, she's safe. Rob Glass for BBC Look North in Sherwood Forest. 
Shall we have some uh, football news now? And Leeds United say they're outraged at the Australian Soccer Association's decision to stop Mark Viduka playing in Saturday's match against Man U. Now, United are said to be considering legal action against the move. The player himself says he's extremely disappointed. Viduka pulled out of an international friendly in Venezuela, saying that he was injured. But the ASA were unhappy with the explanation and have used a rule that bans the striker from playing for five days after the game he missed. Bradford City players have agreed, in principle, to defer their wages if they're asked to. As we told you last night on Look North, the club is dangerously close to having to go back into administration just 18 months after coming out of it. The squad, as they did last time, are prepared to do what they can to help. There is no point, um, just as there weren't two years ago, of demanding payments when they're due that further backs the club into a, a difficult corner. What we all want is for the, for the football to, club to survive. And uh, that's, the, that, that's the goal for everybody, really. So um, I don't really envisage there being uh, any kind of problem. And uh, Scarborough's former lone player, Ashley Sostanovic, has been included in the first ever team of the FA Cup. The midfielder was named as player of the round for his performance against Port Vale. He'll attend the FA Cup final in May and join a parade of other winners. Sostanovic is now back with his club, Sheffield United. You see, I can do Sostanovic, <laughs> I just can't do Sonic. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose this wasn't exactly Intercity 125, but 200 years ago, this week, this contraption changed our world forever. Yes, it was actually the first steam locomotive built to win a bet and now one of the stars of this year's Rail Fest at the National Railway Museum in York. Now, they were testing a replica at the museum today. So, of course, our transport man, Alan Whitehouse, couldn't resist going for a look. Steam's up, but will it actually run? The same question was on the lips of the Penny Darren locomotive's inventor almost exactly 200 years ago to the day. We're up bright and early to get up steam and uh, we seem to have a good amount at the moment, so full steam ahead, as you say. This is just a replica, but it has all the unpredictability of the original. We open the steam regulator and hope that it goes one way or the other. And if it goes one way and we don't want it to go that way, we pull this one and it goes the other way. So we'll just try it, shall we? The original Penny Darren worked first time too. Surprising, because its inventor, Richard Trevithick, only built it to win a bet. It wasn't designed as a locomotive at all. He, he was into putting his new compact power source in as many places as possible, and that included on the plateways of South Wales. But, but it wasn't designed as a locomotive. He was saying, look, you can do anything with this thing. And you just can't overestimate the impact this must have had. Just imagine, in an age of horses and carts, this comes steaming and snorting out of a shed at you. It must have been terrifying and exciting all at the same time. But it changed Britain and the world forever. Within 25 years, the railway age had dawned. And for the next 100 years or so, there was no other way to travel. The ability to travel further and, and cheaper was very important, although not everybody could afford the railway's fares. Um, moving goods more quickly was, was very, very important. That had a knock-on effect right across the economy. Um, you know, everything had to more or less travel by train in the 19th century and well into the 20th century as well. But it's not just about steam. The story includes this electric locomotive, one of a pioneering class built specially to operate across the Pennines, and the Japanese bullet train, which attracts thousands of visitors every year. Alan Whitehouse, BBC Look North, York. So if you love trains, you know the place to be. <laughs> now, this has been one of the strangest stories, I suppose, we've done this year. After 50 of the coldest days and the coldest nights of the year, one of the most unusual protests we've ever reported has come to an end. Peter Finnegan has spent 20 hours a day in a tiny portable toilet to highlight the lack of government money being spent on hospice care for children. Now, today's protest came to an end and he emerged to crowds of well-wishers. Danny Carpenter was there as well. He's a celebrity, get him out of there. Peter's supporters know who their favourite personality is and who's endured the greatest trial. Excellent effort, very well done. 
I couldn't have done it, but I think he's done really well in this weather. <laughs> I think it's been amazing, and I'm, I'm really proud and privileged to have met him. Do you not think it's a slightly strange way to make a protest? I do, actually. <clears throat> I think sitting in a loo for fish, over a thousand, for a thousand hours. His stay in the smallest of smallest rooms has gained an international audience for his cause. Oh, Radio Wales, yeah. But he's glad to be putting porridge behind him, both kinds. I won't have to put up with my wife's porridge every morning because I, I, I just can't explain. I've never liked porridge, but while I've been in here, it's been a blessing in the morning because it's been warm, you know. Now, some people will say that this is a potty way to make a point. But whatever you think of Peter's methods, you can't deny his commitment. It's cramped, it's uncomfortable, and it's very cold. Just some of the reasons why the end of this sit-down protest leaves Peter a very relieved man. Danny Carpenter, BBC Look North, Bolton on Dern. Loads of things we could say. Flushed with success Absolutely. and all the other cliches. Yeah, yeah. I know we won't bother because we're going to move to <laughs> our own cliche now because, uh, you know, everyone likes to do a little bit for charity and Paul is no exception. He's done a doodle, well, it's a masterpiece actually, <laughs> to help raise money for epilepsy action along with other celebrities such as uh, Elton John and Alan Titchmarsh. Now we've heard Elton's has gone for about 10 grand. Oakley Boy Alan's must be worth thousands as well. So what about yours, Paul? Tell us the details. Well, shall we have a look at it? Please yeah. do. I'm embarrassed to say that on eBay tonight, mine's been bid at £11.50. <laughs> How fantastic is that? Who's man enough to us. do that? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, so get bidding. As I say, Elton John's went for 10 grand, so mine's gone for a bit of a, an £11.50, and that's down to Em. That's as down well. to M. Hudson as well. It looks like a child's done that. I don't know whether you can see it, but <laughs> they there we have. Are. <laughs> they <laughs> have. That's right. Correct. Uh, right, uh, we've got some very, very exciting weather to talk about. Uh, it's a long way off, but we're fairly sure by the middle of next week we're going to see a return to very cold North East Lids and an increased risk of snow, especially towards the east of the region. There could be some wintry showers by the end of the weekend as well. So it's all turning colder, but in the meantime, it looks as though it's going to be very pleasant indeed. Clear skies today. We saw temperatures at Leeming around 9. High pressure means settled weather, at least for the next 36 hours. So it's largely clear out there. A lovely night for stargazing. I think by the end of the night, just a little bit of fair weather cloud. Temperatures in the west around about minus 1 or minus 2 Celsius. So there will be a fairly widespread air frost across much of the region. So the sun rises in the morning at 7.18. It sets from afternoon at 5.23. So a glorious day for much of Yorkshire and the North Midlands. A little bit of cloud here and there, but long sunny spells as we head through the day. A similar forecast for North East Yorkshire, Moulton, Pickering and Scarborough just seeing limited amounts of cloud. Quite breezy in the south, but in the sunshine feeling pleasant. Temperatures as high as 7 or 8. That's the forecast. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we've had uh, plenty of reaction to the news that there's a possible film about the Ripper being made in Hollywood. Harry, you start. Yes, I think that making a film of a convicted murderer may deter others from going down the same path. That's from Cathy in York. Uh, Emma Connor from Brilliance says Peter Sutcliffe should have gone to the gallows, not have a film made about him. He's a monster. And Craig says maybe the makers of the film could put their money where their mouths are and donate a portion to charity. Thank you very much for your reaction. See you tomorrow. Good Bye -bye. night.